This presentation is brought to you by the European Reference Network, Cranio. We will be discussing common issues arising when dealing with difficult airways in children with craniofacial malformations. Several patients' photos will be shown throughout this presentation. The patient or their caregivers have all given consent to use these pictures for educational purposes. Problems with airway management can either be caused by difficult mask ventilation, difficult visualization of the larynx during direct laryngoscopy, or difficult entry of the trachea. For the description of the visualization of the larynx during direct laryngoscopy, the well-known cormac lehane score can be used. One of the most crucial issues when dealing with children with difficult airways is to recognize the possible difficult airway before a problematic situation occurs. As a general rule, these are the risk factors for difficult airways in children. The Malampati classification is a scoring system to assess the airway. This simple scoring system relates the oropharyngeal space to the size and position of the tongue. A higher Malampati score can be related to a difficult view of the larynx by direct laryngoscopy. Another easy assessment of the airway is the thyromental distance, which is the distance between the middle of the chin and the middle part of the thyroid. A short thyromental distance is also called retronathia or micronathia. Especially in the pediatric population, there are many syndromes and diseases that are prone for difficult airway. Next to the known craniofacial malformations, metabolic diseases such as MPS, upper airway infections such as epiglottitis, and hemangiomas and lymphangiomas can all cause a difficult pediatric airway. The Pierre-Robin sequence, or also called Robin sequence, is characterized by a triad of hyperplasia of the mandibula, glossoptosis, and difficulty breathing, sometimes leading to airway obstruction and hypoxia. It is often but not always accompanied by a cleft palate. Pierre-Robin sequence is associated with a difficult airway and especially with difficult visualization of the laryngeal inlet on direct laryngoscopy. A cormac lehane score of 4 is no exception in these children. These children can often be managed quite well with a laryngeal mask. Another syndrome which is notorious for a difficult airway is Treacher-Collins syndrome. Present in 1 in 50,000 births, the facial characteristics include malformation of the eyes and ears, mandibular hyperplasia, narrow nasal cavity or coanal atresia with a small mouth opening, cleft palate. The combination of these features make for a difficult mask ventilation and difficult view of the larynx. Hemofacial macrosomia, or golden Haar syndrome, is characterized by a marked asymmetry in the craniofacial development with malformation of the ears and possibly mandibular hyperplasia. The latter can give rise to difficult visualization of the larynx on direct laryngoscopy. Cruzon syndrome, or craniofacial dysostosis, is a rare syndrome causing craniosynostosis, early closure of one or more seams of the skull, and hyperplasia of the midface, causing facial malformations, such as shallow eye sockets and decreased growth of the maxilla. Children may have upper airway obstructions and sleep apnea. Due to the facial malformations, mask ventilation may be difficult, and also direct laryngoscopy may be challenging. A prospective observational investigation carried out in multiple centers in the USA has identified the risks for difficult intubation and for accompanied complications. These are children under 10 kilograms, more than two intubation attempts, short thyromental distance, or more than three attempts for direct laryngoscopy before switching to another intubation technique. The reason why small children are more at risk of complications is because of their lower functional residual capacity, relatively high oxygen consumption, and high carbon dioxide production, which causes a faster desaturation, which may lead to bradycardia and cardiac arrest much sooner than larger children or adults. Because desaturation in small children is so much faster, there is limited time for one intubation attempt. 
Therefore, more intubation attempts may be needed. Subsequently, every intubation attempt potentially induces swelling or bleeding, further compromising the difficult airway. It is therefore of vital importance to always keep administering oxygen during difficult intubation, for example, using a nasopharyngeal airway. Another way to ensure the continuous administration of oxygen is by using Optiflow or Thrive. The continuous flow of oxygen enables longer apnea time and reduces the amount of intubation attempts and desaturations. The maximum flow administered should be adapted to the age and weight of the child. The most important question you need to ask yourself upon recognizing a possible difficult airway is, am I and are we equipped and experienced enough to deal with this difficult airway in our center? Or should we discuss with or refer to a specialized center? For instance, when considering a child for sedation or anesthesia, ask yourself whether this child has a normal airway. If not, subsequently ask yourself if you have the facilities and expertise to manage the airway safely. If not, and if there is no life or limb saving situation, do not start or stop the procedure and refer to a center that specializes in management of difficult airways. However, there is always the possibility that you did not expect a difficult airway or a transfer to another hospital is not an option. In that case, there are a few tips for dealing with difficult airways. First, always call for help. Second, ask yourself, does this child really need an endotracheal tube or could it be handled with a laryngeal mask airway? Remember that in young children under one years of age, a shoulder roll can really help positioning as well as external manipulation on the larynx using backward, upward, rightward pressure. Always maintain spontaneous breathing as long as possible and ensure an adequately deep level of anesthesia before attempting intubation. Remember to desufflate the stomach, especially in children with difficult mask ventilation, and last but not least, consider waking up the child when intubation is unsuccessful. An essential part of dealing with a difficult airway is preparation and thorough communication in a timeout procedure where different scenarios and airway plans are discussed with the whole team involved. Make sure you have all necessary materials ready for the various scenarios. This includes different size ventilation masks, oropharyngeal tubes, laryngoscopes with different blades, laryngeal masks, endotracheal tubes in different sizes, and stylets. Also consider using short-acting anesthetics. There are many different flowcharts available to aid decision-making when dealing with an acute situation and a difficult airway. We will show some examples of difficult airway flowcharts. When primary approach to intubation is unsuccessful, always keep administering oxygen to the patient. Plan A is to optimize your intubation approach. Ensure whether ventilation through a face mask or supraglottic device is possible. If ventilation is possible, realize that you have time to consider other options, your plan B. It is also vital to communicate with the team that adequate ventilation is still possible. In this time, you can try two further attempts at intubation, either using a different technique or device, or let the most experienced intubator perform the intubation. Remember to have a maximum of three intubation attempts in total before moving to the exit procedures. When these intubation attempts fail, consider waking up the patient, proceeding with mask ventilation or supraglottic device, obtaining expert help, intubating the patient with a flexible endoscope, performing a rigid endoscopy with ventilation endoscope, or in extreme cases, performing a tracheostomy or cricothyrotomy. When you're in a situation when mask ventilation and supraglottic ventilation is not possible, you are in an acute and life-threatening situation. There is no time for additional attempts of intubation. First, bring the entire team up to speed on the dire situation the patient's in and call for help. Immediately move to the emergency procedures, rigid ventilation endoscope or emergency cricothyrotomy. 
There are many different flowcharts available to aid decision-making when dealing with an acute situation and a difficult airway. Another example are the flowcharts from the Difficult Airway Society, which are available on their website. Please visit the reference for more information. It is important to develop an airway flowchart in your own centre, according to local protocols and available equipment, in which all involved specialities are trained, and with all emergency telephone numbers on the flowchart. A good example of such a local flowchart is this one from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne.